Of all the actors who came of age in the 80s, few seemed as destined for superstardom as Rebecca de Mornay. Her wit, humanity, and charisma seemed to put her a cut above her contemporaries. But where did her career end up taking her? While she never reached superstar status, you've probably seen more of her than you realize. De Mornay got her foot in the door of Hollywood with a minor role in 1981's One from the Heart, a musical romance from director Francis Ford Coppola. If you haven't heard of it, it's probably because it hasn't held on in pop culture like some of the director's other movies, such as The Godfather, Apocalypse Now, or Jack. But it was still a strong start for De Mornay, who followed up her debut with a breakout lead role in Risky Business. That movie, a legit 80s classic, practically made an icon out of her co-star, fellow up-and-comer Tom Cruise. If you're totally unfamiliar, Risky Business is a classic coming-of-age tale where boy meets girl, except the girl is a mysterious prostitute and the boy is an inexperienced suburbanite. The two meet when Cruz's questionable decision-making skills land him in serious financial straits, forcing him to find a unique way to make a lot of money in a short amount of time. The result is a comedy about a homegrown brothel that somehow stays charming. The movie made Cruz an overnight superstar and marked De Mornay as an instant it girl. But while Cruz's star power continued to grow, De Mornay's new status proved a little bit harder to hold on to. After Risky Business, De Mornay's career took off. She followed her breakout film with a supporting turn in 1983's Testament, but her stardom took a serious hit in 1985 with the poorly reviewed baseball rom-com The Slugger's Wife. You can't blame her for jumping into a film written by Neil Simon and directed by Hal Ashby. It just didn't work out. Luckily, De Mornay kept her footing with a pair of solid supporting turns in 1985. The first, a heartfelt drama called The Trip to Bountiful, found her sharing scenes with screen legend Geraldine Page in a movie that got attention from the Oscars. The other, Runaway Train, is more of a pulse-pounding crowd-pleaser, with the actress as a railroad employee working to thwart two escaped convicts that have sabotaged a train. Despite having a story by Akira Kurosawa and earning three Oscar nominations, the movie is now often overlooked. But it was impressive at the time and helped keep De Mornay's career chugging right along. In 1986, De Mornay caught a ride with the rock band Starship. Specifically, she co-starred in the music video for Sarah. The song was one of the most successful tracks of the year, climbing the charts to hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100. De Mornay appeared in the video for the shamelessly schmaltzy song alongside Starship singer Mickey Thomas, telling a story about a dissolving relationship. Despite its contemporary success, the song doesn't get much play anymore, but at least it hasn't become as hated as We Built This City did. Though the 80s started out strong for her, De Mornay spent the second half of the decade starring in projects that ranged from questionable to downright abominable. These movies included And God Created Woman, Feds, and Dealers. But the worst one was 1987's mind-bogglingly bad version of Beauty and the Beast. On paper, it didn't sound so bad. The movie was one of the only few English-language adaptations of the classic fairy tale and the first to come up with the idea of turning it into a musical, beating Disney to the concept by a full five years. John Savage was cast to play the Beast to De Mornay's beauty, but neither was served well by the finished product. The movie was criticized for being half-hearted and uninspired, with less-than-stellar makeup effects and unmemorable music. The actors deserve credit for performing the songs themselves, but it was ultimately a risk that didn't pay off. After a string of cinematic misfires, De Mornay hit the reset button on her career. The actress kicked off the 90s with a small-screen role as a bomber pilot in HBO's Emmy-winning Cold War-tinged original by Dawn's Early Light. The next year, in 1991, she found herself at the top of the box office when Ron Howard cast her in his smash-hit firefighter drama Backdraft. While De Mornay's role is only a supporting one, her skills on the big screen still showed. It's a performance that must have made an impression with her peers, particularly director Curtis Hansen, who cast her as a villainous would-be nanny in his 1992 thriller The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. De Mornay more than delivered the goods as the psychologically damaged character, and this time found herself the lead in a blockbuster hit that held the number one spot at the box office for four straight weeks. De Mornay spent the 90s coupling her acting projects with producer credits, the work including Never Talk to Strangers, The Winner, and A Table for One. De Mornay also made an appearance on the mid-90s revival of the popular anthology series The Outer Limits, on which she earned her one and only credit as a director. Her episode The Conversion premiered as the 12th installment of the series, telling a complex, violent story. The Conversion follows a man fresh out of prison and harboring a serious grudge against his former employers. The sort of grudge that drives him to pick up a gun and open fire on his old office's Christmas party. As one might expect with the sci-fi fantasy series, all is not what it appears to be. 
with De Mornay playing a key role as a mysterious woman who may or may not be pulling the strings on the whole situation. Well, what were you thinking about? Find a drink for someone you don't even know. Maybe I feel like I know you. Working behind the camera, she handled the challenging material with style and grit, delivering a violent, clever character study about mistakes and second chances. She also got to direct her old Beauty and the Beast co-star, John Savage, in the process. Rebecca De Mornay's career continued to flourish throughout the 90s, but 1997 saw the actor take one of her biggest risks yet when she landed the role of Wendy Torrance in the made-for-TV miniseries adaptation of Stephen King's The Shining. The story had already been adapted by Stanley Kubrick almost two decades prior, with iconic performances from Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall. With the original being regarded by many as one of the best horror movies ever made, the stakes were high for the three-part miniseries, with comparisons to the classic first adaptation being inevitable. King, being no fan of Kubrick's adaptation, took on the task of scripting the episodes himself, resulting in a four-and-a-half-hour adaptation that's as faithful to the novel as possible, for better or worse. As for De Mornay and her on-screen husband, Steven Weber, each finds a way to make the characters their own, helping make their version of The Shining a respectable effort that has Stephen King's seal of approval. After finding some genuine small-screen success with the Emmy-nominated adaptation of The Shining, De Mornay wasted little time booking her next TV gig. She ended up landing on one of the greatest and longest-running series ever produced, ER. De Mornay made her debut in the first episode of the series' sixth season, playing Elaine Nichols, a wealthy seductress in a relationship with Noah Wiley's Dr. Carter, with the twist being that her character is also the recently divorced ex-wife of Carter's cousin. What was it you said? I'll be thinking of you tonight? I guess I meant it. Throughout De Mornay's arc, the pair faced numerous challenges, including the obvious family turmoil, their dramatic age difference, and eventually, a breast cancer storyline that sees Carter trying to be supportive as Elaine endures a mastectomy. Eventually, the couple ends things with Elaine running off to Europe to start anew, and Carter staying in Chicago to continue saving lives. Though De Mornay's role lasted just five episodes, it remains one of the series' more memorable guest appearances. Though she's had serious successes on the small screen, De Mornay has always done her best work in feature films. A shrewd bit of casting gave De Mornay a chance to showcase the full range of her talents when she played the role of an aging TV star with a nasty streak in James Mangold's psychological thriller Identity. Conceived as an Agatha Christie-style whodunit, the movie is an ensemble piece following a group of strangers stalked by a murderer in a seedy, isolated motel. At the same time, the movie focuses on the testimony of a potentially schizophrenic death row inmate whose mind may hold the key to the gruesome mystery at hand. Needless to say, there's a lot to unpack with identity as the film twists and turns to an unexpected conclusion. Over 15 years after its release, the movie remains a uniquely satisfying mind-bender that just so happens to feature one of the best performances of Rebecca Du Mornay's career. Though she was blessed with leading lady looks and acting chops to match, De Mornay has never been one to shy away from playing compelling supporting characters in bigger movies. More often than not, she's made the most of these minor roles, bringing rich personalities to even the most marginal of characters. Of her supporting turns, few were more memorable or more brief than her role as a vindictive divorcee in the opening moments of 2005's outlandish comedy Wedding Crashers. She's the woman who traded barbs with Dwight Yoakam as one half of a soon-to-be-divorced couple, who are forced to remember the good times by Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson's divorce mediators. Though the scene clocks in at just about three and a half minutes, it serves as a perfect tone-setter for the raucous action that follows, all mostly thanks to De Mornay. Ben. You shut your mouth when you're talking to me! Now, more than four decades into her career, De Mornay's professional life has continued to flourish. Like many former It Girls and young movie icons who came up exploiting their sex appeal, De Mornay has made a second career of sorts out of playing moms on screen. In the last 15 years alone, she's played a parental role in over a dozen projects on screens both big and small, including turns on John from Cincinnati, American Reunion, Mother's Day, American Venus, and Hatfields and McCoys, all while playing real-life mom to two daughters of her own. Of course, De Mornay's most memorable turn as a fictitious mother has been as Dorothy Walker, the fame-hungry woman whose daughter is Trish Patsy Walker on Netflix's Jessica Jones. Like many of her supporting turns over the years, De Mornay brings a hefty dose of humanity to the role, helping make a complex human being out of what might otherwise have been a shrill, patently unlikable character. Taking you in was the worst decision of my life. Thanks, Mom. As Rebecca De Mornay nears her 60th birthday, it's clear that the acclaimed actor has no intention of slowing down, having recently completed a two-episode arc on Fox's Lucifer and appearing in 2018's family drama Periphery. 
As for what lies ahead, we expect to see De Mornay reprise her role as Dorothy Walker in the third season of Jessica Jones. She's also slated to play a key role in the Nick Cannon-directed women's basketball drama She Ball. From there, the sky seems to be the limit for the gifted career performer. One thing we know for sure is that she seems primed to continue playing strong, intelligent, complex women on TV shows and movies for years to come. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.